Got it. Okay, so before we start talking about the book, um, T, you mentioned you had some like data epistemology you wanted to talk about. That sounded really interesting. Actually, why don't we talk about the book and I'll probably sneak it in because it's connected to a lot of the book. It, it's okay. growing out of the stuff I do at the end of the book, so. Perfect. Uh, so the book is called Games Agency as Art, uh, which first of all, I love the title of that, like Agency as Art, I think is, that really caught my imagination. Um, sadly, I have it on e-reader, so I can't show the cover. Um, but I was really impressed by the ambition of the project uh, to start off with. Oh, there it is. Nice. Um, yeah, the ambition of the project, which is to unify things like football and Halo and like tic-tac-toe and rock, paper, scissors and King's Cup and chess. That seems kind of hard to do. Um, so how did you go about doing that? How did you like start thinking about that? So, I mean, that's the hardest part. And I didn't do that. I borrowed someone else doing nice. that. So one of the... Um... One of the really interesting things is, so a, a lot of this project started from um, a place of anger and rage. I was teaching an aesthetics class and I wanted to do a case study on video games. And uh, I wrote a bunch of things with my students about the art of video games. And I could read entire books that focused on the cinematic qualities, the scripted qualities, the you know, the graphics, how much they look like movies. And I remember at one point reading a 300 page book and it talked about skill and decision for half a page. And the rest of it was about how games were, and this is a really common theme, the games are kind of interactive cinema. And I got really mad. Um, and one of the things I know from the history of, um, from art history is a lot of the times when a new medium comes about, people immediately try to make it work like old mediums. Like when people got ph photography, they tried to make it look like impressionist paintings by like making it fuzzy and actually kind of fighting against what the medium did. So it seemed to me like this is a case where well, we have a theory of fiction and film. So games are kind of like that. And it also reminded me of the fact that, so I grew up, I've been playing games my entire life. I My first games were like Infocom text adventure games. Like I was just the right age to start with, you know, open the mailbox, right? Um, and I also saw this tendency in mainstream games that made a bid for being arty of suppressing choice and suppressing decision to put things on a rail to make it more like a movie. So you could have these cutscenes and cinematic qualities. So it's just like, this is not like, the, what this person is describing about games is not what I love about games. And there's something really similar about a strategy game like Civilization and a game like Go. There's, there was something that unifies them. And so yeah. I, I, that's well that's interesting because you're saying like this was born out of curiosity of a new medium yeah. but it seems to me like games are like as old as civilization right? this is so exactly that's exactly right so when you look at most of the literature that's about the value of games uh recently about video games they tend to treat video games as kind of like magical new th there's this old literature about the value of play and there's a very tiny bit of stuff about, oh, chess is a beautiful game, soccer is a beautiful sport. But mostly the video game literature is focused on the unique newness. And I was like, no, nah, that, that's not the full story. And I was casting around and I found this book that I talk about constantly in my book uh, from Bernard Suits. And the book is called, uh, sorry, I'm making tea right now because I just, the rest, it's Saturday. So I'm parenting. So I'm, I've been up since six in the morning with my kids. Um, so... Uh, Bernard Suits is this incredible philosopher. He wrote this kind of cult classic that was almost lost for a while and got brought back called The Grasshopper. Uh, it's supposed to be a defensive, you know, the ant and the grasshopper, the ant works and the grasshopper plays. It's a defense of the grasshopper. It actually starts in this like mock Soc Socratic moment with the grasshopper dying on his deathbed. Actually, before you go on, could you explain the ant and the grasshopper a little bit more? Oh yeah, the, so the ant and the grasshopper. So there's this old parable about, you know, the grasshopper plays away the whole summer and then dies. And the ant works hard and saves and survives, right? And it's supposed to be like, work hard, don't play, put your nose down, get shit done. Um, and this book is supposed to be a defense of the grasshopper, of the ideal of playing as the meaning of life. He actually has an argument in the, at the end of the book where he says, what would you do in utopia if all the practical problems would be solved? He says, you'd play games or you'd be bored out of your fucking skull 
And so games must be the meaning of life if they're what we do in Utopia. It's a wild argument. And I've been thinking about it for a decade and I think it actually might work, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. But early I mean, in the that book, is my dream Utopia. <laughs> yeah, so. it is. So, um, so early in the book, he gives, you, he gives what a lot of people thought was impossible, which is a definition of games that crosses a lot of activities. So the definition, there's a long version, a short version. The, the short version is to play a game is to voluntarily take on unnecessary obstacles to make possible the activity of striving to overcome them. So I'll, I'll say that one more time. To play a game is to voluntarily take on unnecessary obstacles to make possible the activity of striving to overcome them. So this is basic story where he says like what it is, another way he puts it later in the book is that what it is to play a game is that you take on some constraints and those constraints are constitutive of the goal. So what the goal of the game is, is actually made up of essentially of doing it under certain constraints. So here's an example, simplest example. The point of a marathon is not to cross the finish line of just being at that point in time and space. You have to do it not using a car, you have to run, right? And I think the point is if you cross the finish line having if you cross the finish line having used a car, that doesn't count as crossing the finish line. Does that make sense? What it is to cross the finish line is to do it while running in a marathon. Similarly, if you go to a basketball court with a step ladder and you climb the ladder and you move the basketball through the net, you haven't made a basket, right? Does it make sense? So what it is to make a basket is to do it within the constraints. So this is, for me, the re what this shows, what, what Suits was really interested in is what this shows is that games are not uh, places where the outcome matters independently, right? If all you wanted was to be at that point in space, you would get there as efficiently as possible. The fact that the goal we are pursuing in the game is partially constituted by the constraint means the constraint plays an essential role in the value of the activity, right? It's like stupid to do it some other way. Um, like you lose the value of the activity. And so that's supposed yeah. to be all games, right? In all games, there's an end point and you could get theirs in some easier way. Like I could, we could be playing chess and I could be, say, I would be like, look over there and I steal your king, right? I've taken your king, but I haven't done it within the constraints of the game. So it's meaningless, right? So th that's his, that's his account of a game that you are struggling to overcome obstacles on purpose, right? Uh, elsewhere, he says, you're taking the inefficient way for the sake of the inefficient way. And that account of games I find incredibly compelling and it crosses Dark Souls, chess, poker, I'm a rock climber, marathon running, all kinds of things. And it also kind of leaks out. If you, if you buy this, it turns out that a lot of, some people might be working for to survive, but some people might be engaged in their work partially as a game. Um, and I think that tracks a lot of the natural notion. So I got interested in this partially because I love games and partially because it was like this, this glimpse of a story about the meaning of life. Yeah, that's beautifully put. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? I think Kutub had a question. Uh, I, I have, I have a question. It's like, it, it's about um, something like later in the book, I guess. Uh, and so maybe it would be uh maybe it would be good to ask it later um uh, or or give give a, a little bit more time to like go through the book um before i ask it uh yeah sure so something that i wanted to ask about was like i i found it interesting in your account of people categorizing games that like some people like some games are clearly art it's like very obvious that that certain games are art, and then other games are not art or, or haven't been thought of as such for a very long time. So could you talk about the, um, I think it was a game by Romero called Train. Okay, Train. Everyone loves this example. This is not my favorite example, but this convinces other people. So Train yeah. is a- Train other is, people. Yeah, uh, Train is a board game uh, made by a conceptual artist meant to be played in a museum. And um, as it looks like a German classic economic resource maximization game where you're building your most efficient railway network. And as you play it, the game gives you more and more hints and you discover you're building the Nazi railway network to carry people to concentration camps. And Romero was really interested in whether or not people would stop playing or not. 
So the reason I immediately, like, that's really obviously arty to people. I mean, it has all those, it's very high concept. But I think the way that it's arty has little to do with its particular execution as a game. So I'm really interested in games that give us beautiful or otherwise interesting experiences as games. So I think, for example, the thing about Train is it's not actually interesting to play. It's not mechanically interesting, right? It does, it, 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 it layers on this really interesting thematic question, but as a game design, it's, I mean, it, it, lo it looks to me a lot like a lot of very high concept art that you get out of New York right now, where there's a cool pitch, but there's not actually anything interesting to look at or interact with. I'm much more impressed by games. And the thing is, they're hard to explain, right? You actually have to play the game. Games yeah. have incredibly complex, in I mean, um, I mean, uh, I, I don't play it, but I'm listening to people play it. Like I am convinced that Dark Souls, like everything that's going on mechanically is incredibly important. Uh, I get really interested in German board games that are really intricate auction mechanisms where there's a complex uh, market auction that you have to manipulate involving manipulating other people's incentives. And one of the most interesting games to me right now is uh, Root, which is a game by Cole Worley, which is this simulation of vastly different sides of a socioeconomic conflict, where one of you plays basically the bourgeois industrialist cat. It's like adorable theming. And another plays like underground squirrel communists. And another side plays like the old warlords that just want to bring back war. And another side plays like a religion that's trying to convert everyone else. Another side plays an arms dealer trying to make money off of the conflict. And you have totally different goals and totally different ability sets. And the interaction turns out to be incredibly fascinating because when you play through the game, you actually get to see like the mindset of the industrialists trying to bring their logistical network to work is so different from the mindset of the communist uh, faction, which actually the, they're really weak at first. Uh, but they spread easily. And every time anyone attacks them, they get sympathy of the people tokens that gives them, you know, extra, it's it's wild. It, yeah, uh, you're like building and, an underground resistance network and trying yeah. to foment rebellion. Yeah. And because each side has different mechanics, what you start to do is you learn to play by figuring out what other people are going to do because of their mechanics. So it simulates this complex perspectival shifting. So that shit I find incredible. Uh, actually, the yeah. most interesting world to me right now is indie tabletop role playing, but we can talk about that later. Yeah, I'm really into that world too, actually. Um, and so, actually, on that topic, I wanted to thank you because you brought my attention to a game called Sign, uh, oh which I, I played that game because of this book, and I had an amazing experience with it. So, did you want to talk about that, or? Yeah, well, tell me what your experience was. Yeah, sure. So the idea of sign is it's based on a real event that happened in the 1970s in Nicaragua, where uh, the government gathered up a bunch of deaf children with the goal of teaching them how to read lips. Um, and that objective completely failed. It was it was a it was a total failure. And what happened instead was all the kids just got together and invented their own sign language. And uh, that sign language became the foundation for modern Nicaraguan sign language. So to this day, that's still like you know, the, the basis for, for a real sign language and linguists were flying in from all over the world to study this phenomenon. And so in the game, you play as one of those uh, children. So um, I, I t had a camping trip last year and I played this game with six friends, which was super high quality. And uh, one person who was me, I was like the facilitator or the teacher. And it was like three to four hours of just no talking it was pure silence and seeing my friends like slowly figure out new ways to communicate with each other was deeply fascinating was deeply fascinating and um the way like you, you get a card which is like a character um and the character has like some kind of personality and the way that personality influenced the language made me realize like that's that's what language is like like there might have been somebody you know 2000 years ago who had some kind of personality who uh like made a word the way it is and that still carries forward to this day right so my example is uh, max how how uh how like um vulgar am i allowed to be on this 
Uh, whatever you want. You're good. Okay, cool. So my example of this okay. is one of my friends, uh, his name is his name's Noah. He was like the uh, like the troublemaker character who had a disdain for authority, and he got assigned to make up the sign for family, right? And so he he comes up with this motion. This is what family means, right? And uh, or no, I'm sorry. It's it's a little bit deeper than that. He comes up with the uh, the sign for parents. So his sign for parents is that. Right, so that's the sign for parents, and then my other friend Nick, his uh, personality, his character is like someone who really likes engineering and building stuff. And so, for example, the sign for fear that he came up with was like this: it's like a building, it's like a structure crumbling down. Right, so that engineering mindset met the troublemaker mindset, and they kind of harmonized and combined. And so, this is the sign for uh, parent, right? And then my friend Nick, because he had the engineering mindset came up with this sign for sibling right and then logically the sign for child would be like this right and then later we found out that uh so my my interpretation of why noah came up with this hand gesture was it was kind of like a flippant hand gesture because he had a disdain for authority but noah actually was like no i wanted this to be like jacking off like i wanted this to be like a masturbatory gesture and we we're like wow none of us were even thinking of that at all and so because of the interaction be between noah's sign and uh nick's sign like nick's engineering mindset this became like basically the sign for family and that got like deeply rooted and encoded into our language so anyway that was a bit of a long story but like that that's that, that game is so good i love is, that game so i mean this is what i mean so sign Sign is a game that isn't just a concept. It's incredible. So, uh, so part of the game is that you have an inner secret that you're trying to communicate, like something you've always wanted to explain to someone. And what the game does is it just gives you, I think over the course of three hours of silent play, you actually get to, to make it possible to play. There are three words. The first is your name and the two are other concept words that you get to hold up a sign for and make a sign. So for four people, you get four names and eight symbols and you have to make up everything else, right? So for example, in our first game, someone made this for love and I needed a sign for hate. So I went, right? And you can kind of figure it out. Of course you can't perfectly. And the game is, I mean, it's about both the possibility of communication and the difficulty. Actually, I've gotten some philosophers of languages and linguists to play this game and now they use it to teach because it's yeah. such a like, but a few things to say about the game. So when I have a house rule for this game, I can't remember if I talked about this in the book, but my house rule was, so at the end of the game, you know, the lights come back on, you, you have the lights low and um, you uh, and you get to talk again. Everyone wanted to find out if they had actually successfully communicated their inner secret. And I was like, no, we're not talking about it. You will never find out. That's fucking light. Go home. Um, and I think for me, this proves, so a key point in the book is that I think there's this difference between two kinds of play, achievement play and striving play. And achievement play is play for the value of winning. And striving play is temporarily taking on an interest in winning for the value of the struggle itself. So I have a couple arguments in the book for that. One of them is that there are some games, I call them stupid games. And stupid games are games where the fun part is failing, but to have fun, you have to try to win, like Twister. So does that make sense? Like you're trying to win, but you don't actually care about winning. But I think the fact that sign is meaningful in that way, that it's playable and you don't find out if you want or not, right? You try to do it, but you don't get the signal. Shows that what's valuable is. Yeah, awful. but t I would actually argue it goes a bit deeper than that, which is um, that one of the core themes of the game is in fact like the deaf experience and yeah. the, the struggle of trying to communicate what's inside you to a world that is not amenable to that. Uh, so I think like your specific example illustrates this really well, and and, and sign is almost like, um, like a uh, like a border between striving play and uh, achievement play. I'm not sure if there's. I mean, well, we can. We, I, I don't. Though I think it actually. So I think striving and achievement play are mentalities that vary from people to people. Um, but the claim, my claim, isn't that it's all all striving play, but that at least. In, if you if you can enjoy the struggle without knowing whether you want or not, that shows at least somewhat that you're a striving player. But yeah, sign is if you like sign, there are some other games you might want to try. There, uh, one is the Quiet Year, which is a really yeah. interesting tabletop role playing game where you build I've a played that game as well. Yep. And the new one that I didn't have and would have used in the book if I'd known about it is the Mind, 
which you should play. Do you know the mind? Yeah. I've played the mind as well, yes. Is that, is that the there's... game where you count up numbers? Um, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I actually play that. That's I now teach uh, game theory and game design class. So University of Utah, one of the reasons I'm here is that it's one of the world's top game design programs. And I'm teaching a yearly philosophy of play and aesthetics of games class. And Mind is the first game we have them play in Quiet Year is the second. Yeah. Have you heard of Microscope? Uh, yep, I, play Microscope. I love Microscope. Yeah, when, so this is stuff. When, when people ask me, when people in... When people who are not me want to defend games as art, a lot of the times they point to either train or they point to heavily cinematic cutscenes games. Um, and I think those aren't necessarily success. They're art, but they're not necessarily games as art. They're not, they don't center the gameness. Where sign, it is completely about the experience that has been created for you through a rule set where you're lost in this very gorgeous practical experience that's very moving and very intense and completely forgettable mind when i was asking my students about what they thought about mind mind is a game where you have to in silence play figure out how to play cards uh in sequence together which involves kind of tuning into each other's timing and i asked my students what it's about you know what what if you had to say what this game is about what's it about there's no theme it's just this kind of pure game and one of my students was me they said intimacy he said I'm a jazz player and there's an intimacy you can get with other people's sense of rhythm after a year. And with this game, you can get there with strangers in 10 minutes. It's about like intimacy and communion. And that's what, what's fascinating yeah. to me is that it doesn't get you there by borrowing the cinematic or fictive techniques of moving people. They, it gets you there purely from the manipulation of constraints and goals to get you into a kind of practical activity. And I think that's the unique art form of games. Yeah, that's something I really like. Uh, something I really like to do is bring the mind with me to airports and play with strangers. It's almost like it's one of the most universal um, or maybe like global games you can play. It's great. Yeah, It's funny because my game design program is mostly very industry. Like people are interested in, it's like a very like, you're going to go to EA, you're going to make the next Halo. It's not very indie. And then like, we just start with the mind and the quiet year and students already say like, independent of all the theory, just playing those kinds of games blows open their sense of what games can do. Mm. Uh, like there's a That's really interesting. So even yeah. game people, students of game design aren't aware of these. Yeah, but I, I think it's like, but remember, it's a very specific, I think if you want, it depends on the school. If you went to a school like the NYU game design, that's a very high theory, full of indie people and LARPers and stuff. The school I'm teaching at is people that want to make uh, Medal of Honor, right? Not yeah. all of them, but like a lot of that is the, and so you, you, you can be in that world and have no idea. I mean, a bunch of my students know these games, but t the majority of them don't. And I think a, a, one of the interesting things is I asked them in the beginning, like, what are the aesthetic qualities of a game? What makes a game good? And early in the class, what a lot of them say th are addictiveness and fun. And by the end of the class, playing games like this, you have language like it, it's intimate, it can be connected, it can like open your sense of what's possible, it can change like your relationship to other people. Like, like games are so potent. And uh, one of the complaints I've had is that on the high culture side, people want games to be like, on, like movies. On the pure game world, there's this obsession with addictiveness as like the, the, the biggest praise for games. And that is such a narrow form of praise. Like, it's like, is, is addictiveness the only good quality in food? Fuck no, sushi's not addictive. It's something completely different. Yeah, have you heard, have you heard of the, um, the book Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha? Oh yeah, I love Nine Fox. Yeah, it's great. Um, I, I was reading about his inspirations for that book, and there's a really interesting book about slot machines in casinos. And... Addicted by design? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, like the what I learned from that is people are playing these slot machines not even because they're trying to gain, like money is not even a concern for them. They don't care about money at all. It's about the experience, the raw experience, the flow state you get into. I don't think you... it's, I want to be really careful. I, I teach that yeah. book in this class and people, when they read that book, immediately want to say it's about flow state. I don't think it's about flow state. So we actually do a class about this. Uh, if you read that book, what she says, it, so the classical description of flow state is 
absorption in the intense practical details of activity. When you're in a flow state, you see things, you know things. When I'm in, I'm rock climbing and I'm in the flow in the flow state, it's about knowing everything about my body and the rock. It's focused but detailed. Her description of the state of machine gambling is called she calls the machine zone, and it's the experience of the complete annihilation of consciousness and awareness. Mm, it's so uh, yeah, it, it sounds addiction. more like heroin. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's why I brought it up because you were you're talking about addiction as yeah. being like the primary quality, and it seems like these slot machine designs are really like yeah. they're almost like the the, the pure crystallization of that yeah. aspect of gameplay. Yeah, um, which actually brings me to the last section of the book. You were uh, I was interested in like how games like games as a capacity, the capacity of games to transform uh, social systems, both like good and bad. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Oh, by the way, I saw a hand up. Maybe we want to from Jared oh, for a miss, while. Yeah, did I miss? Yeah, I, I I just wanted to to like bring in a, a comment because about kind of this this like games as art art discussion because it's it, it is a, a, a cultural conversation that has frustrated me for a very long time for similar reasons that we've already said. And like I, I, so in my undergrad, I was on the board of my my school's game development club, and we would have meetings pretty often where we would try to parse that. We we were all like huge. I, I mean, it was video games specifically most of the time, and there was often a bias towards like people being fond of indie games and stuff because it wasn't necessarily people who were looking to get like industry jobs. We just all really loved games, um, so there was a lot of talk of like indie games and and so on. Um, and, and we would try to have meetings where we would try to parse out what aspects of games were enjoyable or good, right? And they, and it would actually be, we would focus on like, what are the, you know, not worrying about like these big ideas of like, oh, it's addiction that makes a game fun or, oh, it's flow state that makes a game fun. It's like, no, 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 wait, let's actually talk about like, what is it about the characters in the game? What is it about the, the interaction with the game? You know, what, like different mechanics, boss fights, motion, blah, 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 story. Um, and, and whenever we would talk about like games as art, or at least get into that kind of idea, um, it, it usually they were pretty interesting conversations. What bums me out in general, and I think we've, we've sort of mentioned this, is like when people point to games as art, when, when they want to argue for games as art, a lot of the examples end up being these extremely boring like high concept like like you would never actually want to play them but like oh it has this like really deep complex theme and it's like well that's that's not remotely interesting it, that's it, also it, true of a lot of other media though like in sure. film like people bring up like a lot of really high concept films that you may not want to watch on a saturday afternoon sure which is why I always, when I go see films, I have to take into consideration both the audience score and the critic score. And I and I have to prioritize, because anytime I see a movie that has a high critic score and a low audience score, I'm probably going to hate it. And it's probably going to be extremely boring, right? So it's weird to me, it, it, like, as what we've been saying, it's weird to me how, like, fractured and bad the discussion of games as art tends to be where the arguments in favor are so often extremely boring dull like serious explorations of like the soul and then the examples against are like the like you know triple a vomit and whatever saying like oh there's no there's no like creativity put into this and it's like there's so many things in the middle that are really interesting games and they're made with tremendous care and make you feel something and it's bizarre to me that those what, what, that are, what are your games... examples like what are what are the examples that you really like uh, like what are, i'm trying to get a picture of like the middle that you're talking about i mean it's probably most games i mean like I don't know, take any Mario game. Like they're Mario is they, fucking genius. They are, yeah, they are cre they are created with tremendous care and if you are going to go make the comparisons to um like if you're going to try to do your best to convince somebody who's skeptical you're probably going to want to make the relation connect connect it to mediums that they're 
are already familiar with. Like when we talk about cinema, like, oh, the cutscenes are good. Well, who cares about cutscenes in many games? Okay, fine, Mario. Let's talk about like, like many of the newer Mario games have a tremendous soundtrack. They're beautifully animated, right? Um, the, and it's like, oh, those are things that you can connect with like cinema, for example. But yeah, even just, yeah, go, go ahead. I think part of it is that there's, one of the things I was trying to do, was, so I think I participated in something similar to what your experience, but with board games. I was an early forum member on the site called Board Game Geek. And I feel like we spent a lot of times trying to come up with, like you were saying, not this kind of high theoretical thing, but like, let's just talk about what makes this game good. And a lot of the times that what we came up with was like very specific things about the how the mechanics shaped the decision spaces and shaped the decisions you had to make. Um, and I think that, but one of the goals I had for the book was, I felt like what was happening from conversations I was seeing online, you would see like forums and game reviewers really getting it. Like, I felt like the heart of the game, but also like kind of not having a clear critical language. And they were, when they were reaching for a kind of finer language, there was a pre-made one for cinema and they would grab it. And having that pre-made language kind of shifts you and subtly captures you into the theoretical viewpoint of cinema scholarship. So one of the goals of the book was actually to kind of, since I am a person that knows philosophy of art and art, art history and art theory, to give, to create something like a language that's it's not mine. I was just trying to be like the philosopher who, you know, is good at making distinctions. It was basically like me reading game developer blogs and forum posts and trying to like get that language and clarify that language. And and I actually, I one of the best forms of feedback I've gotten from the book is I've had a bunch of game designers write to me and they're like, oh my God, this gives me the language to talk about what I felt, but didn't have the words for about what I cared about. Yeah, that's really interesting. And in particular, I had a bunch of game developers tell me that they had, there was the kind of games they loved and then they thought to make serious games, they had to do this kind of heavy narrative, thematic, very openly, bluntly, kind of serious, arty thing. And that having the kind of language I was giving in the book helped them be like, oh no, what I actually care about is the manipulation of agency to create interesting, practical experiences. Um, so that, that that was one of the things I wanted to do. Um, the The kind of, it's funny because I think like, I mean, I, 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 I'm a person that loves both like trash cinema, fun as shit stuff, pure action movies, but also fucked up heavy art shit. Um, and I think all of that is valuable, but there's a way of, there's a way of doing fucked up art shit that is where the difficulty itself is valuable. And then there's a way of doing it badly where the difficulty is just a signifier of seriousness. And I feel like a lot of the, that's the easiest path to make your game look serious. Um, and I think the harder path is decades of fine tuning of micro mechanics. Yeah, is... you mentioned Root. Root has the opposite approach, right? Root has like dead serious mechanics inspired by these like real world counterinsurgency games. And then yeah. the art is like super cutesy and, yeah. and you know, childish almost. Um, and it serves as like a cover. It, it almost like hides the, the, the grimness of the mechanics. I know. It's so It's yeah. such a good piece. Um, you were mentioning though the um, like language, like providing a language for game designers. I was really interested in like aesthetic philosophy more broadly uh, because I don't really know anything about aesthetic philosophy. So I was wondering if you could talk about like harmonies, various harmonies you identify in the book. Like what is harmony and what right. are the harmonies in games? So, I mean, harmony is kind of a, so one of the interesting things about aesthetic language is one of the basic theories of aesthetics that I'm the most drawn to is that there's the art world is the world where you cannot have a finished formal taxonomy. So other systems are kind of closed systems where you can define every term and know exactly what every term means and know exactly how you apply it. And there's this basic claim that people think comes from Kant. I really like Frank Sibley's version of it, where he says that what makes aesthetics distinctive is that aesthetic terms are always kind of open-ended um, that you can't, there's no rule bound way of knowing exactly what qualities will make something elegant, exactly what qualities will make something funny. You just kind of have to do it and see it for yourself. 
And also that you can never list all the ways that something could be beautiful. There's always going to be a surprise, right? At some point, I think there are, you know, I think in some ways, like before Quentin Tarantino, people didn't know that art could be amazing in that way. And then Quentin Tarantino has this like new kind of weird manic meta-ness that like people are like, oh my God, that's a new kind of thing that art can do. So one thing you one thing you can't do is give, I mean, it is weird that the account is a definition of what makes art art that says it's exactly the train where you can't define what's important clearly, that it's kind of open-ended. This is in my non-game stuff, this is stuff I'm super fascinated by. I find that like uh, I've been writing a bunch of stuff about the difference between aesthetic reasoning and scientific reasoning. Um, but uh, the, so one of the things that I was trying to, I was just looking for some kind of recognizable language that we knew from aesthetics that wasn't about just like the fictional qualities. And so I was, so what I end up saying in the book is one of the things you can experience, one of the ways that makes games distinctive from other traditional arts is that the beauty isn't in the thing made by the artist, the beauty is in you. Like you are the thing that is beautiful, your actions, your decisions are elegant and interesting. Um, and so I was trying to say that in some cases, the thing that seemed really interesting was a harmony between you and the world. And what I was trying to use was like aesthetically familiar language to describe the experience of something just being at the edge of your of your ability, right? Like what so many of us like is not games that are too easy, not games that are too difficult, but games that are just right at that edge. And one of the things I think you get is uh, I think this is something you don't get much in life. A lot of life forces you to do things that are shit boring or completely overwhelming and impossible. And because games are voluntary spaces where we manipulate the ability set and the uh, obstacles, you can find one because we have difficulty settings in different games where you can find one that is just your limit. I mean, this is why you have things like, I mean, video games, difficulty settings, climbing, climb, climbs have, climbing difficulty grades, right? There's like 16 grades of bouldering difficulty. And the whole point is that you know exactly where your edge is. And normally when most climbers go out, they look for their edge because they want to be at the place where they fit precisely. And that, I just use the word harmony because that's, um, that was the best language I had for this experience. I mean, that people I think often don't talk about of just being barely enough to do the thing. Uh, and that's what I think not all, but a lot of us love. Um, right. So I think you're talking about um, harmony of capacity there. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Uh, but you also talk about a different harmony, which is harmony of action. Yeah. Right. So. Maybe right. So about there's, there's, uh, so there's, uh, so the harmony of action is that your solution fits the problem. And the harmony of capacity is that the solution is just at the edge of your capacity. So. I, my my description was when I perfectly climb elegantly a climb that's easy for me, that's harmony of action, but not harmony of capacity. Uh, and when I perfectly climb something at my limit, that's both. But sometimes they trade off. Like when I climb at my limit, I have harmony of capacity, but actually my, my climbing is imperfect, right? I'm much more perfect and lovely on easy climbs. Like often I'm kind of ugly and shaky on the climbs at my limit. And But that's a different kind of beautiful experience. It's not me being elegant. It's like, Right. Um. Yeah, I feel like the best games, certainly the um, my my favorite games have like a harmony of harmonies, right? Yeah. It's like where harmony of action and capacity intersect. Um, so I wonder yeah. if there's something there like meta harmony almost. Yeah. Um, I also hey, wanted my, to ask oh, about. Oh, oh, sorry. Ahead. Uh, are you sure? Mind if I butt in? Or yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I really want to say that uh, I just want to say that um, I'm a PhD student looking into how games can teach philosophy. Um, and like I'm an educational games researcher, so I'm I'm very excited to like finally be in a metaphorical room with you. Um, I love the work like you and Dr. Zagal and like you know University of Utah do. But uh, my actual question is, um, so um, like. You just talked about like, oh, people play games partially because of these harmonies and like a lot of the book is uh, looking into like, hey, why why do people play games? There's this paradox of like, why do people put challenges on themselves uh, to play games and stuff? Um, and I, I have my own little pet theory and I was like really surprised to not see it show up in the book or uh, yeah, just not, not see it show up as much as I expected. And I'm like curious what your thoughts are on my pet theory, uh, which is just that like, 
as an educational games researcher, the way I look at games a lot is that um, games are kind of like this, this, like the original teaching form where it's like, oh, you want to teach someone how to work in a group and you want to teach someone hand-eye coordination while well, you make them play soccer. Uh, and so like way back when, you know, and when we were all cavemen and whatever, um, you know, and, and there was downtime, you would teach, you know, the young kids like how to hunt, how to work together in a clan um, by by letting them play games while, you know, the adults went out and hunted or, or whatever. A, a very, a very uh, simplistic notion of anthropology, but, uh, you know. Um, and so, yeah, um, when I when I think of why people play games in the modern age, it's kind of an extension of like, you know, I want to like on this really, really fundamental level, learn about my capacities, learn about the new shiny weapon that's come out, um, you know, that I can play in the new Call of Duty, uh, learn about like strategy, learn about history. And that's why people play Civ. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you like, uh, or just, yeah, any like thoughts you have on that pet theory, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so one of the one of the things I really like about suits in the background is that a lot of other people try to find a game in terms of a single value or a single function, and suits mm -hmm. doesn't. Suits gives us a metaphysics of games that's independent of value or function. You can value, you can do something for the sake of the activity in order to have the struggle for all kinds of reasons. So his view is compatible with both an educational view and aesthetic view and doing it just for money. That's that's one of the things I like about the theory. And I think in general, it would be really weird if we came up with a singular value. Yeah, like, fair enough. Account that's <laughs> like, look, all fiction is good because it does this one thing. I'm like, fuck you. Yeah, there's no <laughs> way, right? The world is much more pluralistic than that. Yeah. So I want to talk about education for a few reasons. I mean, I do in some sense I do. So chapter four of the book is an educational theory. So mm -hmm. chapter four of the book is the theory that, but it's a different educational. So other people have tried to use games to convey kinds of information that other mediums are already good at conveying, like intellectual ideas or math, uh, and they can do that. But I think a thing that I was interested to show what games could also do that was unique, and my account was that they can plunge you into different agencies and you can become familiar with different forms of agency. So uh, one of the examples from the book is that I play all these Machiavellian scheming incentive games, which turn out to be really useful to have modeled um, when I am in these days, people like me spend a lot of time in university settings trying to keep humanities from de being defunded in favor of the business school and STEM classes. So um, that's that's one thing. Um, so, but more importantly, I think even I'm willing to give that argument. But I, one of the important things for me about the art framing is that for most people, art is intrinsically valuable and not merely valuable instrumentally. Mm -hmm. I think if you give an account of art where every value of it is only educational, right, then you've missed something. And part of it's gonna be that what you, that you're gonna start very carefully, uh, that theory is gonna um, grade art in terms of how useful it is for the rest of your life. So it'll turn out mm -hmm. that one of my worries is it turns out under such theories, so there are a lot of people that give these educational theories about art that are often center on fiction because it's really clear that you learn a lot about the world and people's perspectives from fiction, but that shit handles jazz really badly. Like it's really hard to say what practical skills you get from listening to Miles Davis, right? Like um, it's really hard to say what practical skills you get from looking at abstract expressionism. So I think a complete theory of art, I mean, Obviously, there's. I would never deny that art is educational. I would never deny. So Martha Nussbaum famously talks about how you can learn emotional perspectives through reading fiction. I think that's totally true. But something is really missing if you're va if you have no intrinsic value for art, right? Yeah. I, yeah. So one of my Actually. background theories um, here, I'll give you my pet theory, is that uh, so what a lot of there's some philosophers of technology that have a view like this. Our value system has been captured by the age of industrialism, such that we think things are only valuable if they have some outcome or product. And we've lost an idea from Aristotle that it's things can just be valuable to do in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a response to that. And it's from Aristotle, which is you, you can't get the value of life from making stuff, right? Because what's that for, right? The only full account of the value of life has to be a being enmeshed in an activity itself, right? Of, of intrinsically valuable activities. 
This was Suits' argument. Suits credits this to Aristotle. He thinks his games argument is a version of the Aristotelian argument. That's what the utopian argument is supposed to be. That if games, if if the, when we solve all our practical problems, what we do is play games. That means doing things has to be valuable, right? Just for the sake of the doing without any further outcome. Yeah. So I, 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 I guess like my, my, my pet theory was like very explanatory and like how I view it, but I never, I, I guess I never like thought about the, the implications of that, especially if you're arguing about STEM schools and stuff. Um, right. I, I guess one, oh, sorry. So I, I just realized that, look, so, so just to finish the thought, I totally think games are educational. I think games can be used for education. I I play a ton of games in my classes. Um, I play I play like I play like catch the trader games like Spyfall in my social epistemology classes about fake X. Like I use games all the time. But I think a theory of games that tied all their value to an education. It's like that's I mean for me. I don't like that sounds like a really businessy thing to say like shit this stuff is only valuable <laughs> if you can make people better workers you know, and make more money like fuck that right a life where you don't have art and play that's valuable in itself is a life that's empty and so part of the core of one of the i i really think bernard seuss's book is a book about games that's trying to get to the meaning of life um and i think that one of the things that i really want to push for is the idea that games are also just a form of intrinsically valuable play. And that the aesthetic account gives you a version of that. Because I think most people think you don't need to justify your experiences of beauty. Like, here, 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 like if someone's like, look, okay, you know what? Documentaries are much more good for you than Quentin Tarantino. Don't watch that shit, right? You'd be like, fuck you, that stuff is awesome. Right. Yeah. Um, Actually, T, yeah. real quick, if I may interject, um, there's a there's I recently read this really great essay called A Mathematician's Lament by Paul Lockhart. And he does this really like I think what he says might even go a little bit farther than what you're saying, which is what he says is like math at its core is pure creativity and problem solving for its own sake. And like the whole reason we invented math and came up with these like really complicated tools was because we just wanted to understand problems, not because because it was going to help us do something in the world, but just because we were curious about it. And that's the only reason. But the fact that math also just so happens to be so good at manipulating the world has actually degraded it. It has robbed it of, uh, or, or like power structures have come on top of that and stripped all the joy out of math, right? But you know what kind of math is basically useless? I think that's what chess is. I think chess is math done for the pure pleasure of doing math with very little practical application. Like that's, right. Um, yeah. the, 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 but the, 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 yeah, that, that, yeah no, that's, that's enough of that, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's, that, that's why. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. And it's funny that you mentioned being in a position of like defending uh, games to like, you know, against business schools and stuff. Cause actually the, the position I'm often in is defending games in terms of like why build an educational game instead of building a you know just a, a video or even like just writing a book you know uh, and like trying to educate people via games and actually a lot of the arguments that i bring up are based on agency as art because um i argue that like games are the best things at teaching us various um like forms of agency allowing us to live um you know the the entire idea of like uh, that, or sorry, I'm being too much of a researcher right now because it's it's under some research scrutiny. This idea I'm about to bring up, but like the idea that you can embody other personalities and gain empathy of like understanding what it's like to live as like a racial minority in America. Uh, but anyway, so I I bring up that like yeah, hey, games are like the one medium that can do this really effectively. And so if you're trying to teach about this then like making a game makes a lot of sense. And like, um, you know, as opposed to just writing a book about, um, you know, living in a certain way or what have you. I mean, I totally believe that, right? I, I mean, one, one of the core ideas of the book is that what games are good at is manipulating agency. And that's incredibly powerful for all kinds of things, including education, art, and mind control. So <laughs> yeah. like, it's good for all that shit. Um, <laughs> And oh yeah, I, uh, I remember your mind control argument. The, uh... Yeah. Uh, so may I, I, mean... may I ask a question about this? 
Um, yeah. I, I'm wondering where the art sort of resides. So for example, if we think about like a martial art or something like rock climbing, maybe rock climbing is a better example because you're familiar with it. Does the art reside in the placement of the holds on the wall at the gym or in the way that it is executed when you go up the holds or both, right? Um, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Great fucking question. I actually didn't have a good answer to that. If you have a question from reading the book, uh, that's correct because I don't answer that in the book and I try and I do it badly. And I figured it out a year after the book published and I wrote a different paper called The Arts of Action where I give a much better theory. So here's, the answer is gonna be, it varies heavily. So two things, one, one aspect of games is that uh, they, um, one thing about, so here's, Here's a first uh, a key distinction. So in the book, one of the things I say is there's a difference between uh, what I call object arts and process arts. So object arts are kind of traditional arts where the artist makes something and the thing is beautiful, right? The book is beautiful. The movie is beautiful. The games are different because the artist makes a thing and then we interact with the thing and we are the thing that's beautiful. So that's a process art. So I think many games are probably, often games are a mixture of both, but the thing I'm really interested in is the process art. So where is the art? So I think a useful way to put, think about this is who's responsible for the beauty. So, right, who's responsible for the elegant? And this gets really complicated. So Nick Zangwill is this philosopher of art and he has this neat definition of artistic responsibility. He says, artistic responsibility happens when someone realizes that a certain arrangement of non-aesthetic properties will give rise to some aesthetic properties. And they put that arrangement to give rise to this other thing. So as an example is like a painter, like puts this line and that color to give you an experience of like glue, right? They have aesthetic responsibility. Where is it in games? It totally varies. So example, if I, as a player in Dungeons and Dragons, come up with a cool story moment and do it to be cool, that's on me, not the designers of Dungeons and Dragons. On the other hand, I think a great Portal is a great example. The people that made Portal made the puzzles in a particular way and laid out the rules and the puzzles in order to give you an experience of beautiful epiphany. Does that make sense? So I don't understand. So, and when I play through, I'm just kind of, right? The It's actually, I mean, I think the experience of Portal, like especially puzzle games, like Braid, Portal, Baba is You. So many people just trying to solve the puzzle, have this experience of intense intellectual delight and beauty. And that's, be, that's all on the game designer. So I think you get this complex involvement. So some, I think some activities, um, so some activities, it's gonna be mostly the player, right? They're free to do shit. I'm watching my kid make shit in Minecraft. And I think the shit he makes is mostly, the, the, a lot of the qualities are just on him. A lot of the times it's so, in some games, it's so much about the game design. And in other places, it's gonna be this complex interaction where I think a lot of the times in good indie tabletop role playing, the fact that something cool happened, happened because both a player saw a clever opportunity and that opportunity was more likely because of the incentive structure of the game. And so then you get a distributed responsibility and the best model for that might be things like um, group artists, like, you know, the director is not the only person responsible for the movie, right? This is incredibly complex interaction of lots of people. And so I think the best model there is a lot of the times the responsibility is complexly spread across the designer and the player. So it's gonna, re I think games are heavily variable in this aspect in a way that other art forms aren't because there's such a wide latitude of how much interactivity there is. Like, I mean, I think, one of the exact one of the reasons why I keep coming to these puzzle games, for example, that are very game designer centric, is that there's often only one solution, and so the actions are quite prescribed and controlled subtly. Where like the really free form ones, like Minecraft and tabletop role playing, there's tons of room for a player just to like run in and do something that's totally of their own. So yeah, I'd actually uh, like to. I have two things, but uh, on that uh, complex interaction thing, I'd like to posit a data point there. Uh, so, for example, with the rock climbing thing, um, you can, without uh, actually, you know, undertaking the course, if you have enough experience in rock climbing, you can just, you know, observe a route even without, you know, a test climber or something uh, and, you know, appreciate that it's, you know, on that, uh, it's devious but approachable, it's on that boundary of achievability. 
that you're mentioning without, you know, with only uh, hypothetical practice, hypothetical practical engagement. So yeah, it really is complex. Uh, and then the other thing is I'd like to go back to the idea of uh, constraints in practice. Uh, I wanna talk about um, cheating as a mirror of the game experience. So people cheat for a number of reasons, obviously, and often worldly, uh, but some of them do view it as like a you know creative exercise unto itself, something autotelic. So um, do you think the lens of striving can be applied, applied to rule breaking? Uh, and Absolutely. does that make it like its own sub game? And, and though in many cases, what I think you're doing is building a new game on top of a pre-existing, so but here, here, so there's so here's an important thing. You can definitely be playing a different game than the people you're playing with. So here's an example that I deleted from the book. Uh, sometimes I realize at a party that someone will be playing a game of one-upmanship with me, and I will bait them into my own private game, which is getting them to accidentally say racial slurs, um, but because some racial slurs share meanings, you know, with the, the, they have homonyms, so. I play a game, they don't realize I'm playing a game. I think one of the interesting things I think is that speed running is often a community where A, you can build a second game on top of a software product, but then there's a meta game of finding the most interesting speed, like inventing new speed runs, right? Playing uh, against the brain. Speed run yeah. categories is itself a game where you are interested in the activity of coming. So. But like, I mean, th that's not what you can have a game that's a contest where you design games, right? Like just so you can have a game where you have a contest to make poetry. And I think sp the speedrunning community is often engaged in the game of finding the most interesting game they can build out of breaking things in the main game. So there, there are all kinds of, there's definitely meta rule-making activities um, you can be engaged in. Uh, so I... So I've only got a few more minutes left. I feel I've got to return to childcare duties because it's the weekend. T, this this was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before think, before you head off, um, what's the best way to contact you? Because I want to send a follow up. Uh, is it the uh, the form on your website or? Uh, actually, let me just type my personal email into chat. Okay. Um, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I think you can see there's a lot of questions <laughs> left that people want answered. This is clearly a very interesting topic. So we really appreciate you coming to talk to us. And you can probably Thanks expect so a decent number of emails. Okay. All right. Thanks, all. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for reading. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank you, Wei, for uh, guiding the event. We appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Okay. Thanks, everyone. This was amazing. Adios.